Uh, thanks everybody for joining today. So uh, Max and I are here, and um, <laughs> we're we are going to discuss uh, a topic that I think everybody's been discussing for you know almost two weeks now, and that's the the NAR lawsuit. Uh, today we're specifically going to discuss uh, any financing implications, and we'll talk about what we mean by that in just a second. Um, but to bring everyone up to speed, um, this is the Spitzer Burnett. I'm sorry, Sitzer. Burnett lawsuit in the state of Missouri, where the jury awarded the plaintiff $1.8 billion. Um, and that obviously is really shocking. You know, it's a lot of zeros there. Uh, anywhere in Remax settled, and they turned out to be the smart guys. Uh, Kelly Williams and NAR took it to court and they lost, and they lost $1.8 billion. So the like the concern here is how can this change the industry? How can we how, how could this change how buyers' agents get paid? Because they uh they they charge that that uh, there's a um it's a monopoly they charge this it's anti-competitive practices the way that the way that uh, sellers offer up uh buyer's agent compensation when we won't we won't get into the details of the merits of the case today because we talked about that with adam last week um but what is important to know is that it's almost certain to go to appeal and also this just happened today the same attorneys just filed to take uh to take it to a class action lawsuit at the national level um, so later later uh, in the podcast today, we'll talk about kind of what that means. And I'm really just going to be reading from an email correspondence that I have with Adam whenever we do that. Uh, so again, today we're going to talk about financing implications. And the concern that we hear is that due to this lawsuit, if buyers have to pay the buyer, the buyer's agent commission at closing, um, you know, if they have to write a check, meaning they're, you know, paying cash for it, that could be really, that could be really impactful. So everyone wants to know. Uh, will lenders pay that buyer's agent commission? Can it be financed? And Max, I'll kind of let you sort of take it and run from here because this is your real area of expertise. Yeah, you know, so I think it's, first of all, it's important to that everybody understand nothing's nothing's changed yet. Um, I know, although I couldn't be uh, on the uh, uh, discussion with Adam, you know, there's obviously a lot that's going to happen, a lot that's going to come through this thing and, and it's all playing out. You know, I'm part of a uh, collaborative, um, it's actually called the mortgage collaborative. And, uh, you know, we, they reached out to um, Fannie Mae and, and Fannie's stance right now is, you know, we're going to go off what the contract is and we're going to go off what's typical, um, for the area and how the contract's written. So, you know, in other words, if the contract's written that the buyer pays the closing cost, and then you have seller paid closing cost and um, what is it, 12A, then that would be part of the IPCs, uh, the interested party contributions. Yeah, and what's funny, uh, so, so I was gonna, sorry to stop you, but like you and I can both rattle off 12A1B. And I th I think the the reason we can do that is because, you know, we, we were uh, making loans and selling real estate you know, pre 2008. So in the, call it 2000 to 2008, I was in the business from 03 to 08. Um, what percentage of loans did you see with buyer, uh, with seller paid closing costs in, at that time? I mean, if I could remember that far back, my guess would be probably close to 98%. I mean, yeah. it was, you know, it was, that was, it was pretty much the norm until you got to, you know, 20, well, definitely 2020, but even 2015, 2017, 2018. I mean, it was relatively common to see buyer paid closing costs. Yeah, definitely. It was so heavy in in the 2000s. Whenever you know, every whenever 100% financing and 103% financing was was the norm. You know, buyers were accustomed to literally bringing nothing, nothing whatsoever to closing, and and so it was normal for us to say, oh well, this is a three hundred thousand dollar house. Um, we're going to offer them, you know, uh, two ninety five with five thousand back. So we're offering them three hundred thousand with five thousand in twelve A one B. You remember? I mean, th that's what I remember very, very well. I mean, there was programs. Uh, I know there's some lenders on here, Neighborhood Gold, and other programs where you could roll in down payment and closing costs and have the seller make a contribution to a nonprofit to cover that. So it was <laughs> there was all sorts of stuff you could do back then. Absolutely, and so, so it takes us, you know, brings us to today, where right now the buyers. What would you say? I mean, just a guess. Average closing costs are for a buyer right now. Uh, roughly three percent. Um, you know, it kind of depends on the sales price, but roughly about three percent, maybe two and a half. Um, if you do buy downs and things, obviously it's going to be more. But you know, in that in that range. Um, it 
And on the sell side, you know, it's seven and a half percent roughly is what we always say. You know, we, if you get it really drilled down, it's probably closer to seven and a quarter. But at the end of the day, it costs about 10 percent for a tra- you know, for real estate to transact. And yeah. I, th- I think what we're looking at in a worst case scenario here, and you and I talked about this in the very beginning, is 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 the buyer's agent commission going to sit on the, the seller side where, where it currently is of the settlement statement or is it going to move? to the buyer side of the settlement statement. And I guess the question and the concern I've heard from a lot of agents is uh, lenders are not going to finance a buyer's agent commission. Have you heard that from anybody, that question coming around? Oh yeah, people are asking all the time. I've had uh, a countless number of agents text me this week saying you should be the first to figure out how to roll in uh, commissions. Um, you know, So of course we'll work on that, but it's, you know, again, from, Fannie Freddie from all the different aggregators, uh, banks, everybody. It's it's a cost that's going to be paid, right? And I think that one of the things that I've really been thinking a lot about this is do we have, uh, does Trek update the Trek form, right? So like right now, it is customary that a seller pay title policy. They don't have to. But it's customary that the seller pays it. So as long as the contract says the seller is paying the title policy, then that does not count in the 3%, 6%, 9% interested party contributions. Same with the survey. If you have the survey box checked that the seller is paying it, that does not count in the contributions that they're allowed to make. So my thought is an easy solution to this is... If this is how it's going to be, there just needs to be another section in the contract that says seller pays, you know, buyer or seller pays commission. Right. So, yeah. And what's interesting, the the promulgated form actually on the on the title policy and survey, and you know, you know this, is that you, you check the box who's paying, you know, who's paying that. So what what will I guess a worst case scenario is that it's disallowed for the, you know, for the the seller to pay for the buyer's agent commission. But I don't really see how that, how that could really come down because, it, you know, they, they're allowed to pay any costs associated with, with the the transaction. I think the problem is that they're, they're, they're saying that right now, um, you know, it's, it's, it's collusion that, that all of us bad realtors have said that only the seller can pay can pay for the commission. And I think what will have to be established is that it could be a buyer cost. It could be, it could be a seller cost. And I agree with you. I think that the contract forms will change no matter what. And I think in a worst case scenario, we probably see that form modifying exactly as you said it, but question for you in um, you know, this is a, I don't know that this is even likely in any universe, but if it were to change today, like, like, like we have to write offers tomorrow and the buyer has to pay for the commission. There, is, there are methods whereby the that we can still roll in the commission so that the seller pays it. Correct? Yeah, sure. I mean, think about it. Right? Like, you even have it now. You have a buyer that's going to buy a Fisbo, and the Fisbo says, "I'm not paying commission." And so you have to talk to your to your buyer. And obviously, as a realtor, you're not going to do this deal for free. Um, so typically, what I see is the sales price gets raised. And uh, then the seller is paying the commission, right? I don't see any scenario where that goes away, where that doesn't happen. So, you know, at, at a minimum, that's how you would do it. Otherwise, back to your point earlier, you, you, you have a list price, you raise the price to X, you have seller pay X towards closing cost, and that, that gets covered. You know, the, the one thing that everybody that I've talked to is really concerned about Obviously, affordability is the name of the game right now, and that's the big hot topic, um, especially for the lower price point buyers who don't have a lot of money and need to put 3% down and have the seller pay all the closing costs. And if the seller's got to pay the closing costs and the closing costs are 3%, but now you got to pay a 3% uh, commission as well, and now you've got 6%, but you're only allowed 3% because you're putting less than 10% down, what's going to happen? You know, I think that's that's the bigger concern. Um, but you revert back to this statement that I have from Fannie Mae that says, we're going to go with how the contract reads and what's customary. So even if you have to raise the price and you've got a spot where the seller is then paying the commission, or even right now it's on 
uh, it's on the back end of the contract. It's at the end well, of the it's contract. In, yeah, so contractually, that's actually not part of the contract. It's it's for informational purposes only because it's separate. Like right now, the structure is the legal agreement we have is the unilateral unilateral offer of compensation that the MLS provides. Um, but I get what you're saying. Like it, you you can technically it's, it, you know, an attorney is going to say like, you shouldn't do this, but you can technically write it into special provisions if you wanted to. So what I'm hearing from you is that, you know, if we wrote that in as seller is paying, uh, you know, X percent commission, you know, on behalf of buyer that they might approve that right now, even if it was beyond the 3%, is that correct? I think, well, I think if you write it in the contract and say seller to pay X percent on behalf of buyer, you're going to probably start to run into IPC Got issues. It. Got right. It. Like that, that's the whole, that's the whole thing. Like, so you, you just, you want to be careful about that. Um, if the special provision says, and again, I haven't vetted this with anybody, but my initial reaction to that is that if the special provisions were to say seller is paying buyer's agents commission, that is probably okay. And and to go back to it, the limits right now on, on the, the current seller contribution to closing costs are only problematic if you have a buyer putting less than 10% down who also needs other contribution to closing costs. How, what, just from your gut, like what percentage of deals they're putting down less than 10% and they're, and they're asking for seller closing costs? 10? 10%, got it. 15 so, maybe, it's, it's, it's low. Problematic, right? I mean, you run into that. If that were to happen tomorrow, which it's not going to, then you would have a certain percentage of, you know, t like you said, 10, 15% of deals that you would say, what are we going to, you know, what are we going to do here? But if I'm hearing you correctly, uh, you know, Fannie and Freddie want to make loans. They don't want to cause, they don't want to cause problems and they want to, they want to increase affordability, correct? Yes, of course. So, I mean, it's, it would seem to me that, uh, you know, they will find a way uh, if that if that cost shifts to the buyer side, I that's how I feel about it. I know, you know, from if you take it back, lenders went through this uh, during uh, 08, right? Frank Dodd came out and, and dictated how loan officers could be paid, and and there was always a compensation, um, but there was all this different variable pay, and then you know there was also a lot of shenanigans that went on, and and it needed to be put into place. Um, I, I witnessed uh, people doing some of these things. And, and, you know, so it's, but it's scary whenever anybody starts talking about your comp is going to change. So yeah. for us, it was now, now your comp is set and predetermined. So it doesn't matter what you do. You have to get paid X. You can have caps, but that's, that's it. This, and this was very different and very scary. And everybody was freaking out because you've been doing things for so long one way and now all of a sudden you're told this isn't how it's going to be anymore and right. you know nobody particularly likes change especially when it comes to their livelihood and how they think they're going to be compensated right so you know i think i think that's a lot of what's going on and i understand all the the yep. fear and concern and doubt and you know is unsettling and uh, you know i think you know, we, and we've talked about this, you and me, right. Where it starts to become, you have to prove your value and what are you doing? And, you know, it's most, I would say the majority of realtors out there are great realtors. They are valuable. They have worth and buyers see that, you know, right. there are some realtors that are not, and, you know, they'll send you to go on your way and just try to get a commission and that's it, but they're not really helping you with the process. Um, you also will have buyers that don't think a, a realtor is valuable and, and won't use them. And others will think their realtors aren't worth a 3% uh, commission. Maybe they're only worth 1% or one and a half and they try to go a discount route. I mean, that's, that, that will probably happen some, you know, it certainly happens on the lending side. And you and I talk about that all the time. Right. Um, you know, and, and I think that's just, I think that's at the end of the day, I think that, um, the good realtors that are already valuable and know how to, tr how to articulate what their value is are going to be fine. Um, 
And I think that the the consumer uh, will understand that. And and I think there's going to be a way to work this into the to the financing where it's just it's really a non-issue. It's just a you know you look back three four years from now and it's just how we do things. Yeah, I agree. I mean, so you know, there's a, a question here that says, well, if we start adding it to twelve A one B, will it cause problems with the appraisal? And it it won't. And the reason why is there's not there are not additional closing costs being added to this. It's just a shuffling of of closing costs. So a commission is a closing cost, always has been, always will be. Um, it is it has been on the seller side of the settlement statement. What a worst case scenario here is we're talking about that shifting to the buyer side. There's some, you know, uh, something comes down from this lawsuit that says sellers can no longer pay this. Uh, and then we say, great, well, it's going to go to the buyer side. Uh, but the seller is going to the seller is going to credit them for for that amount. But to answer the question, you know, those closing costs have been in every single comp you have right now has roughly 10 10 percent in closing costs baked into it uh, whenever you combine the buyer and the seller side. Agree? Uh, yeah. Yeah. And the other thing is, too, the <laughs> the appraisers get the contract anyway. They already see it. So it's not really I, I don't think that has any sort of impact at all. I agree. And And I mean. Appraisers are generally pretty smart. They understand these things. You know, those guys, they, a lot of times uh, when the market was, was insane, a lot of times, you know, they, they would ask, or if you were able to conduct them, they'd, okay, there's multiple offers, right? Well, that's kind of the definition of market value. As long as things, as long as things make enough sense, they would understand why there was an increase. It's like such an increase in, in price. Not to say that appraisal problems don't happen. It's just to say that they understand the market, the market dynamics to go, um, so, yeah, so the concern is the amount of credits a buyer can get, especially the down payment is lower than 20%. It's not lower than 20%. It's actually lower than 10% is what is what we just went over, correct? So it's it's you can roll in 6%, up to 6% if it's 10% or more. So the the, the rule is uh, for owner-occupied and second homes on a conventional loan, uh, if you're putting less than 10% down, the cap is 3%. If you're putting uh, between 10 and 25 percent down, it's or between 10 and 25 percent down, it's six percent, 25 percent down and more, it's nine percent. Right. Um, so, but I mean, I again going back to it, like you remember Jurassic Park in the 90s, where like nature finds a way, right? Jeff Goldblum, absolutely, yep. right. So this is <laughs> you know, this is lenders find a way to. Uh, uh, to make loans. <laughs> so. uh, a, a good friend of mine once told me, um, tell me the rules of the game and I'll figure out a way to win. Right. <laughs> uh, you know, and, um, you know, I kind of live my life that way. And, and, and I really just believe that like, okay, so now we have these old, these new set of rules. This is how, this is how we're going to deal with it. Absolutely. And, and that's, I mean, it's, it's sort of a, an idea that you can't change what is right. Like this is the playing field. Uh, maybe it moved a little bit, but this these are the new rules, and now we have to figure out how to how to play on that field, how to operate operate in this environment. And to go back to what you said a little bit ago about uh, you know good good agents will have no problem with this. Um, I agree with you. I think that good agents will have no problem with this, but there will be additional skills that they will have to learn, and that's effectively communicating your value. Um, what mm -hmm. I've seen. Is it's pretty it's pretty nice right now when you're a buyer's agent and you never really have to have a conversation about commission, right? Have you had a I mean, have you ever had borrowers that you just like send them uh, your proposal and they don't ask you about any of it? Oh sure, yeah, that's pretty nice, but it, but that's pretty pretty <laughs> rare, right? <laughs> of course, yeah, especially now, <laughs> right? Exactly, um, and you know. It, have you, you know, I know that market dynamics change and uh, you guys, you know, the spreads go up and down, but you, you've not seen a dramatic, like over time, like there hasn't been a dramatic, I know right now is a relatively tough time to ask the question, but there, there hasn't been anything that's come in and, and uh, disrupted the industry to such a degree that you guys go out of business, correct? So a couple of things to that, right? Like when we talk about some of these discount online lenders, uh, the ones that don't want loan officers involved, the ones that, right. you know, push button, get loan, all of that kind of stuff. It doesn't, it's, it's been proven time and again, that it doesn't work. You right. still need a human being, right. To get a loan, unless you are a uh, salary W2 employee with 20% down and everything, like everything is, is 
smooth sale. You you have you no know, debts. You have a high credit score. Like you don't need anything. And there there is a platform that that can work on, but it's it's not for everybody. It is for that is for the minority. People still need game plans. People still need to talk about from the financing side. This it's not just about a rate and a down payment and points or no points. It's, we've got to look at the whole package. What is your money at now? How much are you earning on that money? What is your interest rate going to be? There's a lot of that, you know, we're to a certain degree, financial advisors, although we're not licensed financial advisors, you understand what I'm saying. Right. Same with, same, same with real estate agents, right? Like you still have to maneuver through all of that and explain, hold on, this house has cast iron and we're going to have to take that into consideration or it's uh, in Allendale. So it either has had foundation problems or it will have foundation problems. Like there's just a lot of that stuff that's still those, that those people are, are going mean, to need. Right. I mean, that's specific insight into the market. Right. And, and there are a lot of, a lot of different valuable things that agents provide in a transaction um, you know, it, market insight is a, is obviously a huge one. There, there are little things that agents provide, you know, easy access to the property, right? Right. That's worth something. Um, you know, the discount, th there's a, a Redfin's original model. And I, I, there's a lot of, a lot of Redfin agents I absolutely love. And I've been, you know, watched that company change over time, but their original model was, uh, we're going to give you back most of the commission. I can't remember the exact amount, but it was a lot. And yeah. uh, almost, I know it was over 2%. So they were, you know, the, the buyers were, the buyer's agent commission was 1% or less. And, but they were sending everybody to the listing agents and saying, go get into the house on your own, figure it out. And, you know, it's really, it, it, it's really inconvenient to do it that way. So That's there right. are, there are certain people that will go through that um, in order to save a couple of percent. There are, um, I would argue that they have had those options for a long time, they have those options right now. You know, uh, you can certainly, if I were to post on Facebook Marketplace looking for a real estate agent who will give me, you know, most of the commission back uh, in exchange, I just tell you what I want to make an offer on. I would have a lot of, of agents contacting me saying, "Yes, I will do that." There's no question, no question about that. Right now, uh, there are agents whose entire business model is based on put my name on the contract at the builder, and I will give you everything but a thousand bucks back. That's there. I'm not begrudging these business models by any means. I'm just saying that that these exist and they're already filling that need for the consumer. And I don't think the NAR lawsuit, I mean, I, I'm almost positive that the NAR lawsuit doesn't change that in any way, shape or form. I don't think there's any way that the NAR lawsuit um, decreases the consumer's appetite for good service, decreases consumer's appetite for, for convenience in the same way that better mortgage uh, wasn't able to increase borrowers' appetites for crap, right? Um, right. That's just that's just the way the way it is. Uh, so to go to go back on you know what you were talking about a minute ago, where uh, providing value, right, is something that we already do, and you know I think the difference is that uh, buyers agents haven't had to communicate their value explicitly because it hasn't been necessary to have a conversation about the commission early in the process. I know right. a lot of, and I, I've learned a lot about agent practices over the last week. And a lot of agents have used uh, buyer rep agreements, uh, you know, a lot, a lot for a long time. I'm finding that many of those agents that use buyer rep agreements get them signed at the time they write the first offer. And I don't think that that is the smart time to do it because at that point in time, you're sort of glossing over the commission, the commission agreement. When do you guys, when do you guys have borrowers sign disclosures? So our, it's a little bit different, right? So for us, borrowers don't sign disclosures um, until we have triggered RESPO, which means we have a property, ad we have a full app, we have income, social security, there's six pieces of information that you need. One is the property address. And typically it's really, now that you have a property under contract, we're going to send you the loan disclosures, right? right. However, before that, we are going through numbers and sending worksheets and estimates to customers up front because, again, I mean, they need to understand what they're getting into. What is this going to cost me, right? Now, there's there's lenders that don't do that, and there's lenders that just say, okay, you're pre-approved, go about your day, they get under contract. Now they start looking at numbers and buyers are confused and, wait, what is this and what is this, what is this? 
Um, I certainly don't operate my team and my company doesn't operate that way. And most good loan officers in the industry don't operate that way. You, we have to show these people what it's going to cost up front on a monthly basis. Let's talk about how, you know, everybody has to see how much interest they're paying over the life of the loan. At some point, it's better to um, kind of get that out of the way up front because that is a big, scary number, but it's also things to talk about. Right. It, it's uncomfortable to talk about money. You know, it, it doesn't, it, I, when I started listing heavily and, uh, you know, towards the end of when, it, like whenever the last couple of years where I was still selling full time, I was 100% listing agent and it, you get very used to it. You walk in and you don't, you, you don't shy away from the 6% at all. We always charge six. Sometimes we negotiate it, but you would have the conversation towards the end after you showed value and you wouldn't ask them to sign right then, but you would tell them if we're going to continue working together, strategizing, I start spending money. Um, which would mean sending in stagers, photographers, things like that. We have to have this signed, right? And and buyer's representation is a little bit different because you don't start actually spending real money except for maybe you know gas, uh, but you're spending your time. So you will have to figure out, agents will have to figure out at what point uh, they're going to, demand is too hard of a word, but they're going to say, hey guys, listen, like if we're going to work together, we need to have this signed. And you've already talked to them about how much you're going to earn. And at that point in time, you might have to defend it. You know, you hear the word negotiate a lot. Um, negotiations with sellers for me were relatively short. Hey, I want you to do it for five. Hey, you know what? It's a great listing. Um, I will meet you in the middle at five and a half if it was legitimately a great listing. Uh, no, it has to be five. Look, I'm really sorry. That's not part of my business strategy. That's not part of my business plan. I don't do that. I provide really, really great service and I have enough folks that are willing to pay me for it that that that's what I that's what I charge. And I don't think buyers have had to have buyers agents have not had to have that hard conversation really, you know, very much at all, if really ever. There um, was a really well written uh, post on Facebook, uh, either late this week or last, Steve Crosland's the one that wrote it. And, you know, a lot of people have shared it and it's, it's, it's 100% accurate. So as an agent, you spend time, uh, money, gas money, especially with the price of gas as it's been lately. But, you know, time is the most valuable thing that all of us have. Right. And there's only a finite amount of it. And that is worth something. You and I have talked for many, many years about this. Um, my strategy as a loan officer, especially when it comes to friends and family, but but really anybody, Right. But in this business, you have friends and family that will only work with you because they trust you. And you have others that say, hey, I just don't want you to see all my finances. I'm too right. private. I want to work with someone that I don't know. And I've always told everybody, that's fine. I am here to help you. I'll give anybody an hour. Right. Absolutely. Like I will give anybody an hour because sometimes the opportunity is just the opportunity to help somebody. And you don't need it. Not all opportunity needs to be money making opportunity. But at a certain point, you need to understand your value and you can't just give it away for free indefinitely. Right. Absolutely. You know, and I feel like um, those are sort of uh, auditions. You're trying out to be their loan officer. You're trying out to be their agent. You're showing them how hard you're going to work. You're showing them how good you are. But yeah, at some point in time, guys, listen, we need to we need to formalize this agreement. Um, are we working together or not? I would love to work with you. If you still need some more time, that's absolutely great. Um let me know. You know, I'm, I, I can't, I'm not, I, because this is my policy. This is the way I do business. Um, if we're going to keep going out, looking at properties, uh, let's, you know, we need to get this signed. Um, if you disagree with any provisions, let's discuss them. Uh, you know, I think that you will find that, um, few people will, well, fewer people will try to negotiate the commission whenever you shine a light on it, than than you think they will. I was always really surprised at how few sellers, uh, asked me about the commission if I would lower it. And it was because I, you know, did a lot of work up front, sent them a ton of information about their property, met them in person, talked to them about the process, showed them exactly what we were going to do, showed them value in just educating them while we were there. And then whenever it was time to say, hey, do you want to work with me in order to move to the next step where I have to start spending $500, $1,000, whatever it is to work with you? Um, it's just something that I asked for. I have to have this signed and they would have no, they would have no problem signing it or, or they did. And we didn't work together. And that was, that's right. Really fine. Yeah. And that's okay. You don't have to work with everybody. There's a comment in here too, that it's not just time, but skill and expertise, expertise acquired over the years. 
or decades. Um, and, and I agree with that as well. You know, um, it's that is all part of the equation. There, it's going to be tough. So a- agents who understand their value in, in already, like somebody who has, you know, a, a good number of transactions under their belt, um, they've just operated in a way where they haven't, you know, they're not comfortable talking about the commission for a long time. They're, they will they will learn how to do that pretty pretty quickly and they'll get comfortable with it pretty quickly. There will be a percentage of them who don't, who aren't comfortable with it and who might leave the business because of because of that. But learning to communicate your value whenever you already understand your value is just something you have to practice and it's something you need to talk about. Um, the, the agents that I think could have a problem with this are agents who don't understand their own value. You know, there are a lot of agents that I feel like um, maybe think that they are not worth 3% or not worth 2.5% or not worth 2%. And if you feel that way, maybe you aren't, you know, maybe you need to brush up on your actual skill set, your actual competency. Um, You need to get to a point where you believe that you're worth uh, what you're charging the customer. If If you don't think you're charging your buyers right now, you're wrong because the buyers are... They're, they're a part of this transaction is 10% total closing costs. And if there were not a buyer's agent involved, that 3% would go, would go somewhere else. It would be absorbed by the buyers or the sellers or whatnot, but it would come out in the, it would come out in the negotiation. So. Well, and how often, I, I mean, I see it too. I, we're working a deal right now where there are, there's no buyer's agent involved and they want their, they want that 3% either as closing costs or reduction to the price. Right. So how often you see that, right. So that, that, that money is going somewhere. It absolutely um, no. It absolutely is. What's funny, um, not to like change the subject, but it's it, it's a it's a parallel subject. That that buyer that's not using the buyer's agent right now is going to continue not using the buyer's agent uh, after you know any sort of changes in the industry. And what I think we might see if this gets a lot of news coverage, you know, I know that I've I've heard from agents right now that that they're getting uh, grief from what I would consider maybe not the most reasonable sellers who say, oh, well, I, I read about the lawsuits and now I'm going to offer 1% or no commission or anything like that. That's a bad decision in this environment, by the way. But I do think that temporarily we may see more people try to go at it alone, not a ton of them, um, again, because it's not a very good it's not a very good experience. Well, I mean, you know, how many times has a loan officer had to tell somebody how to write a contract? What do you put in here? And and a loan officer shouldn't be doing that. No, we're not. <laughs> we're not agents. I mean, you know, t- I've seen enough contracts to know what you put in the sales price and the cash portion and the remainder, right? Like I know basic math, but the, we shouldn't be doing that. No, no. Um, I mean, like, like, like legally, you shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> no, I know you don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and I think that, but then it also comes down to to the stuff that I was saying earlier as well. What are you going to do with inspections and how do you know what to negotiate for? I mean, you get an inspection, every inspection I've ever had done looks like the house is falling apart. Absolutely. Right. And, and they're super, super scary. Um, and then you're like, oh, that's, that's not a big deal. That's not a big deal. But I, I don't know, you know, yeah. and, and you, you need people to help you navigate that. So the thing is, I, I always say, you know, 80% of transactions are pretty smooth. And and certainly agents provide value in that 80%. They do help them navigate the inspections, things that would be pretty painful. Um, but the 20% that are not smooth, that's where good agents really shine. And there are certain times that we really, really, I'm not talking with time. I'm not talking with, uh, you know, buyers that you worked with for a year before they put something under contract. I'm talking about really hairy deals um, that, that would have blown up without your involvement or that would have resulted in a pretty bad, you know, a pretty bad outcome, really good agents are able to turn those into, they're able to salvage them for sure. And they're able to make the experience a lot better for those clients. So agents can turn into an insurance policy. And I think if you talk about that with buyers and say, Hey, listen, like, I hope everything goes completely smooth. Um, here's the deal. And I would tell, I would say this to sellers all the time. I'd say there are not many situations I haven't seen before. And, and if we run into one of these situations that most agents have not seen before, I, I probably have seen it. And, and if, if I haven't, I guarantee you that I have the network to problem solve it for you. So you can go to sleep feeling really great about the fact that you have somebody in your corner who's incredibly competent and can help you a lot, right? So that, that comes with 21 years of experience and not everybody has that. And I think that that is where some of this anxiety is coming from is that you know newer agents, right? 
how do you pitch that? That's a really tough one. You know, you, you a newer agent that's, you know, helping somebody buy a million dollar house in central Austin, which by the way, is not that that's a relatively normal house in central Austin. It's not a super expensive house. How do you sit down with somebody? You've been in the business for six months and, and you show them that you're going to charge them $30,000. I think that's the, t I think that's the tough, the tough thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, uh, I don't disagree. You know, and the other thing that as you're talking that I've been thinking about, it's not just what are you doing? The agent's value is not just what are you doing before we before we find the house, after we find the house, until we close. It's what are you doing after closing, right? How many buyers need to lean on their agent? My AC broke. Do you have an AC guy? I need to redo my floors. Uh, my house flooded. My AC or my um, my water heater busted, right? I mean, hell, when... We had the freezes here and my water, my, my water heater busted like everybody else's. Um, I, I called you. I was like, yeah. uh, you were like, I got a guy and he was out here in an hour or two with a new water heater versus having to wait. Um, Just got to point weeks. out, you didn't use me to buy your house too, Max, and I'm still giving you that service. So <laughs> I know you found your house off market. I'm going to send you an invoice for 3% after this call. So yeah, I'll pay you one. And uh, that's what you're worth. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's not my business model, Max. It's going to be three. Okay. <laughs> But, you know, so it's uh, it's 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 all of those things that everybody needs to think about, you know, um, well, to, to, to that point. So, you know, we had an awesome uh, podcast with Russell. And whenever I met him years and years ago at a conference, uh, he was speaking and he's an awesome speaker, too. And and he said what and he's talking about communicating value, he's speaking about uh, listings at the time, because that's that's what he knows. But it, it absolutely uh, applies to what we're discussing with buyers rep agreements. What he said was this. Whatever it is that you do, make sure you can explain why it's the best. And he said, if you're on a, a Keller Williams team, explain why working with you on this Keller Williams team is the best thing that that seller you know, can do for themselves. Um, if you're a solo agent who doesn't work with anybody else, you explain exactly why that's the best for them to work to work with you. And so what I would say to this, whenever you're talking about after the transaction, and I've thought about this a lot, if I'm because I had a rough time as a brand new agent, because I was 24, I looked like I was 18. You know, I had to lease apartments for a long time, because nobody wanted an 18 year old to sell in the house. And um, yeah, it was tough. And I had to gain a lot of competency where people took me seriously, I could have done it a lot better if I'd been more thoughtful about it. But if I'm a new agent, and I don't have the experience or the confidence just yet, what do I pitch? what you can pitch is just how, you know, how much availability you have. Not, don't say it in that way. It's like, guys, listen, I'm going to be here for you. Anytime you want to look at a property, I am right there. I'm ready to go. Um, I have access to a ton of vendors. I'm going to help you, you know, make sure that anything could possibly go, you know, anything that could possibly happen with this house is going to be done. What's going to become more important. And I think it's honestly good for the industry is that new agents are going to have to pitch their support system really well. And right now that's not necessary. Right now, new agents, all they have to do is pitch like, hey, I have this key. We're not talking about commission. Who cares? Like, let's jump in the car. You know, it smells nice. I'm pleasant. Let's go look at houses. But whenever you have to communicate value and you're new, you can't hide the fact that you're new. You're going to say something that's a tell that you're new. And so I think new agents are, they will have to seek out mentorship and support. And I think that's good. I think, I think it's great. And I think that they need to embrace that. You know, it's okay to be new and maybe I'm going to be a little bit different because I've not been doing things the same way for 20 years. I've got a different set of eyes on things. Um, I think I think that there is a way to embrace that. You know, you you mentioned the podcast that we did with Russell and it made me think uh, actually another another thing that we talked about there. Uh, and it's kind of been the theme really of the last year and a half anyway is mindset, right? And just having the right mindset on anything. And we're talking to Russell and, you know, I said that one of the things that I talk to my loan officers about is, you know, guys, like, I know this market's not fun. And I talked about a couple other things and he stopped me and he said that right there, like change your mindset on that. There is, there are fun things about this market. Right. Um, so as you're saying that I'm thinking, you know, maybe this will be fun. Why won't it be, this should be fun to be able to explain your value and explain what's going on and create a new way of doing things. Um, I think that you can make this fun. And I think, you know, to something else that we talked about before to be able to gamify it, you know, how many different ways can I um, show my worth and explain my worth? Um, and how can I, how many different ways can I figure out how much I'm worth? 
Um, you know, there's there's a lot of different stuff there that 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 really can be positive from this. Or yes, yeah, or by mindset. Yeah, I mean, start writing down what you know what your pitch looks like. I mean, I don't I don't recommend anybody memorize scripts. I really don't like scripts because I think you need to fundamentally understand what you're talking about. But but you can start writing down like what does your pitch look like? What's your elevator pitch? And you need to believe that by the by the time you're done with that pitch, that that somebody will think it's possible that you're worth you know three percent, two and a half percent, whatever it is you decide that you want to charge buyers, that somebody else would believe that you're worth that you're worth that. And to go back to that positive mindset, right now there's a ton of fear out there, and you know it's really easy to dwell on like, oh, this could change, this could change. Why is this happening to me? There's always a positive to anything. I truly believe that this can make everyone stronger agents. I truly believe that whenever you have to be super transparent about how much you're getting paid, um, it causes you to be good. It forces you to be good. And it forces you to learn how to communicate that. So yeah, agreed 100%. Mindset's super important. Look at the silver linings on this. That's exactly right. And, you know, learning new skill sets is awesome. You know, um, uh, I, I <laughs> it is. I, I very much enjoy it. I know you do too. You're always trying to do different things um you know it's uh like there is there's good things to come of this if we could just convince clark and beck of that and that it doesn't have to be a new skill set in Fortnite, then that would be a pretty big one <laughs> that's you know what that's gonna be that's my gamification right here i'm gonna see if i can figure out a process that um, helps our agents learn how to communicate value if they're having problems with it and i'll use that i'll apply that same process to beck to get to put down the friggin' PlayStation Five and and go do something outside. We'll see if it works with both. That's, that's my pro my process is to take the remote out of his hand and throw uh, him out the door. Exactly, that one works really well. I wonder if I can take that process and apply that to helping agents understand how they can communicate their value. You think that, that would work? Like just throw things at the wall? There's uh, only one way to find out. My that's friend. right. There's only one way to find out. <laughs> yeah. So what else is new? So what are you? I mean, I know. Uh, I feel like you and I talk to a lot of agents all the time. What are you hearing in the ecosystem? What are you, you know, are you, what are the, what are the common questions you're getting right now? Uh, a lot about this, you know, mostly what I get is um, what are you seeing? What's going on in the market? Ha what do apps look like? Have you seen an influx of contracts? Um, that, that kind of thing. People uh, I think mostly wanting reassurance um, that, uh, it's not just them. They didn't do anything wrong. Uh, it's the market is what it is. You know, you and I talk about um, leads and, and leading indicators and, and, and all of that a lot and being on the front lines of loan applications. You know, we, we see a lot of things first and, you know, as lenders, we, we see more transactions than an agent will. Yeah. You guys, you guys touch. So, I mean, you, by definition, fewer lenders, same number of deals. You guys are, you guys are a lot a lot higher volume. Yeah. So it, um, you know, so it's really that, but I, I'll say this, the sentiment in general in the, uh, in the market is, is people have really started to like say, okay, it's not just me. What can I do? Right. And, and so I would say over like the last probably 30 days, it's been more about strategizing. Yeah. You know um, what can we do to, sell these listings what can we offer to sell these listings how can we do things um we've actually just came out on our end with some different ways to show uh builder incentive lender incentive seller incentive whatever it may be um with some um through some different technology that we built to be able to get out to agents quickly uh which is stuff that i'll be kind of releasing publicly um at the masses here here in a bit but um you know so it's been it's it's been a lot of that like we talk about proving value as lenders. We've been, we have to prove our value and not just how can we help buyers, but now how can we help sellers? Right. Um, and what, what programs and products are we coming up with there? So it's, there's been a lot of that um, acceptance of, of where things are. Well, what else has happened? Um, the, I, I looked at the, the, the agent count at ABOR after the last dues uh, were, were required and the agent counts down 5% now versus, yep. versus September. And I, I don't say that because it make, it brings me joy that agents are leaving the business or anything like that, but it, it's an inevitable, I'm sorry, it's, it's an eventuality. It's inevitable that that, that that happens. And I think it's important from that mindset perspective, um, you know, what you're doing, like, what can we do? What can we, 
you know, what can we do to get these houses sold? What can we do to uh, prepare ourselves better for the future? Um, you effectively have two options, right? Like you either do the things um, or you become complacent and it puts you out of business um, or you're not prepared for when the business comes back. So there really is opportunity here. And I know that I turn into this like reluctant cheerleader all the time about the opportunity, but I strongly believe that there's a ton of opportunity. Um, yeah, I, think I agree. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's, you know, everyone on this call, I think, sees it. And, and you know, the people that are left see it. And we talk a lot about what makes this a successful year. And it's still being here, right? Yeah. Um, survived to 25. Um, but to go back to that, it's not just being here, right? It's being here and preparing and like putting yourself the win right now isn't to increase your income. The win right now isn't to say, oh, I increased my sales. If you're doing that, phenomenal. You're you're better than 99% of the agents. Are not, you're, you're doing something better than 99% of the agents out there and congrats. But the win right now is, is to position yourself in a way that when the market does return, um, you are there. You know, they, there's the saying, you make hay when the sun shines, right? Well, the sun is like literally and figuratively not shining today. Um, so prepare for when the sun does start shining again. Yeah, 100%, 100%. Um... And I'm excited. I'm excited for that to come. Um, you know, I think I think we've done a great job of getting ready for that. Um, and we'll continue to improve and, and we'll continue to help others around us improve. Awesome. Awesome. So, awesome. Uh, well, anything else you want to cover or this? I mean, this has been a great conversation. Yeah. You know, I just not not really. I think that uh, this is kind of the hot topic and, and hopefully, um, you know, people walk away from this understanding that there's going to be options for this and it's not the end of the world um if if the buyer if the if the buyer has to pay the commission you know i think the end the end theme of all of this is there are options right. and um you know it's just going to be making sure that uh the lender partner that you're working with uh is is able to maneuver through through the gray to to give you all the options i i agree and and you know to summarize or say it my own way, I think that the the mechanics are there to make sure that that the bar the buyers can still, I'm sorry, that agents can still be paid from the loan, right? Like the like the the agent buyer's agent commission can still be included in the loan. The mechanics are there. That's not the problem to solve. The problem to solve is if you are not comfortable explaining to any buyer today why you are worth what you charge, that's your, that, that is the problem that you need to solve. You shouldn't worry about any of this other stuff whatsoever. You need to really think about what's your value, how much are you worth, and how can I make sure other people understand that? A hundred percent. So if anybody wants to get a hold of me, um, you can obviously Google me and you'll be able to find me or eric at bramlet.me. Um, I did, dude, I got a new domain, 512eric.com. So if people want to like sign up for the industry newsletter or anything like that, they can. And then how nice. can people find you? Yeah, uh, max.leman, L-E-A-M-A-N, at loanpeople.com. You can also Google me, um, L-E-A-M-A-N. And um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, I always enjoy doing these. Um, looking forward to many more. And, you know, if anybody has questions or wants to chat, uh, give me a call. That's awesome. Thanks a ton, man. I hope you have a good good rest of your day and awesome weekend. I guess I'll probably see you on Sunday. So can't, can't wait to see what you look like in later hosen. Later hosen. It's going to be great. <laughs> All right. <laughs> later, Max. Thanks, everybody. everybody. All right. Take care.